In part one of this series on a complete LRGB workflow, we looked at subframe selection and stacking with PixInsight subframe selector and weighted batch preprocessor. In part two, we examined early processing in PixInsight by applying two applications of Blur Exterminator to sharpen and deconvolve stars, then covered star alignment, statistical assessment, color balancing with linear fit, channel combination, and histogram adjustment. In part three, we're going to explore advanced image editing in a non-destructive layer-based image editor. In my case, I'm using Affinity Photo, though you could use another image editor such as Photoshop or GIMP. But if you want to follow along precisely, you will require Affinity Photo for today's video. So I have Affinity Photo opened here, and I'm going to just go to the Windows Explorer with our images in it and drag in the RGB image. It will become the base layer of our editing process. The base layer appears visible but locked. I'll rename it RGBLF to designate what it is and that the image was color balanced using linear fit. Then I'll duplicate the layer and make the original layer invisible. The original layer will form a proof layer that we can draw upon later if any mistakes are made or even if I just simply need to duplicate the image for another purpose. Once I have my duplicates of the RGBLF layer, I'll then drag in the luminance image and it will form a new layer over the RGB layer. To the top, just the right of the center, you see what looks like a magnet. It's the snap tool. By turning it on, when I drag the luminance layer over the RGB layer, it snaps into place, perfectly aligning over the information below. Now, on their own, the two layers might not look like much. The RGB looks like it has some washed out color and soft definition. The luminance layer looks like it has harder definition, but it lacks color and it's over contrasty. However, this is a good thing. Both these images are flat and not overprocessed, which means they are ready to be combined. To do this, I'm going to use a composite mode. Compositing is one of the most powerful editing tools at your disposal. In videography and cinematography, compositing is the key to using things, simple VFX like green screens and adding any kind of special effects to an image, as well as just making targeted, dramatic, and select changes to an image. And the same applies to photography. With compositing, we can add any kind of VFX, special effect, or specific editing strategy to our images. What compositing does is it adds the information in whatever layer is above to the layer below. And what we need to do here is get much of that luminance information where our brightness and much of the definition is found into the RGB information that's easily accomplished. With the L channel selected, I'll just go to the composite window above and select screen. Now the luminance layer will add all of its information to the RGB layer below it. Affinity Photo will show us the effect of each of its nearly 40 composite modes as we move our mouse cursor over them. But when we click on the screen composite mode, screening is applied to the luminance channel. And as you can see, all the luminance information has been added to the RGB. The image becomes color and all the brightness information and sharpness have been improved. With the luminance and RGB LF layers visible, I'm going to right click on one of those layers and select Merge Visible. This will create a new pixel layer that will contain all the information found in the luminance and RGB LF layers. Now I'm going to make the layers below invisible to show that they are no longer active in the editing process. That's just a reminder for me. It doesn't really make any difference for the actual editing process. Now we have a good image, but I want to cultivate it, make the signal appear stronger. And to do this, I'm going to further apply the power of compositing, utilizing a technique that dates all the way back to the 80s, long before consumer-grade digital photography was even a thing. The technique is called the Orton Effect. The Orton Effect used to be used to selectively strengthen the saturation, vibrance, and definition of an image, and at the same time apply a delicate blur, giving an image a dreamy cast. I have modernized the technique and applied it to astrophotography by removing the slight blur and keeping the parts of the technique that improves saturation, vibrance, and definition. To apply the Orton technique, we're going to duplicate the pixel layer twice. Then I'm going to name the topmost layer Vivid Eyes and the next layer below that Screen Eyes, just to serve as a temporary reminder what each layer is doing. I need to temporarily get the topmost layer out of the way, so I'll make it invisible by clicking on the white circle. And on the screen eyes level, I'm going to apply another screen composite. This will cause our combined pixel layer to fold the information back on itself, or in other words, to add the same information on itself twice. This creates a very strong effect, in particular over brightening the center of the image. So I'm going to slide down the opacity of the screen eyes to layer to about 69%. And then I'm going to further temper the screen eyes layer's effect on the image by opening up a curves tool. 
changing the curse tool to the lab lighten mode, which will cause the curse tool to only affect the brightness within the image. And then I'm going to pull down the upper side of the curve, which will reduce the luminance in the brightest areas of the image, getting the brightest areas of the image more balanced with the darker areas. Now I'm going to make the uppermost layer visible again, the layer called Vivid Eyes, and I'm going to change the composite mode on it to Soft Light. Soft Light makes darks darker and brighter areas brighter, while leaving mid ranges largely untouched, and it also adds color on top of color, enriching color. It usually has a very pleasing effect on an astro image, dramatically enhancing dynamic range and enriching the colors. But it has a strong effect, so it has to be toned down and this is easily accomplished by drawing down the opacity slider. The goal is to adjust opacity so that the darkest areas are not lost and the brightest areas are not blown out, while enhancing and enriching the billowing clouds in the darker shadows of the image. However, the dynamic range in this image is so wide that the soft light composite mode introduces too much contrast, so it is deleted because we must adapt to the demands of the image. Instead, I'll just work with the second screen layer. The core of the nebula is still over bright, so I'll just open the Erase tool to the left of the image, set the flow to 20% and hardness to zero, and with the Screen Eyes layer selected, erase a little bit of it out of the center, thus rebalancing the brightness in the image. Afterward, they're not shown, I'll put back in a Vivid Eyes layer and set the opacity at just about 5%, just enough to slightly enhance the dramatic contrast within this image. The image is looking pretty good, but the color information is a bit weak. I need to augment the color information. I could spend another night on the Star Queen, filming in just RGB and leaving out the luminance channel, and that would take more time but would give me a stronger color signal to work with. Or I could use compositing to take advantage of the color in the RGB LF layer that I already have. Let's do that. Here's where I put the Vivid Eyes layer, set for opacity of 5% back into the image. Then I'll go to the bottom of the layer stack and duplicate RGB LF, label it RGB Pull Color to remind me what it's for, and then I'll drag RGB Pull Color to the top of the layer stack so it influences everything below. Then I'm going to change the composite mode of the RGB Pull Color layer to Color, so that it emphasizes the addition of its color information to the rest of the layer stack. Now, once again, I'm going to combine all the information into a new pixel layer so that it can all be edited together. Also, to unclutter the layer stack, I'll select all layers below the new pixel layer, and above luminance and RGB LF, right click on them and make them into a group, and then make the group invisible to get them out of the way to simplify editing. Now we have beautiful and dramatic variation of light and shadow within the image, and it's time to begin developing color. So I'm going to open the channel mixer tool. The channel mixer tool is very powerful. It allows us to change the nature of each channel right across its full range of luminance. So it'll alter the way the red from the darkest to the brightest colors appears within an image and the same with the green and the same with the blue channels. And my goal is going to be to develop the reds in the redder regions, but pull the green and the red out of the middle regions, which presently appear white so that we can draw out the blue that is hidden away within that area. I'll go ahead and open the channel mixer tool and set to work. Now, the application of this tool I find to be fairly counterintuitive. I've used it for a long time, so I have a good sense of what it's going to do to an image, but even then, using it right takes a lot of practice and many iterations before I find the color balance that I'm looking for. I'm just saying that if you're new to this tool, expect to spend some time in practice. And it's a good idea if you understand the relationship of the color wheel and how the interplay of those three color ranges affect a full color image. If working in RGB on the channel mixer tool, you can choose between the red, green, and blue channels. And you'll notice that whatever channel you're on, red, green, or blue, will have red, green, and blue sliders. This means that you can change the influence of red, green, or blue within each color channel. So you could conceivably change the quality of red to look pinkish, purplish, or yellowish, or you could add to or alter any of the color channels entirely. Accomplishing anything, such as transforming an LRGB color scheme to an HOO or SHO color scheme. And you can also discreetly change the alpha of a channel as well as its offset. Alpha adjusts the transparency of a particular channel within an image, and offset adjusts the overall influence of a color channel on the image as a whole. However, the vast majority of the time when making adjustments to the colors on the channel mixer, I just work with the red, green, and blue sliders. Unfortunately, trying to find the right color balance proved elusive. Eventually, I came to accept that I just wasn't going to be able to get the blue that I was looking for in the center of this image, the blue that I know should be there, because there just is not yet enough blue information in the image. And that's a problem that I'll deal with later. We'll talk about it again toward the end of this video. 
In the meantime, I'll just delete the Channel Mixer tool and we'll carry on to the next step of developing. Now before I get around to addressing the lack of blue in this image, I'm going to improve its sharpness. And to do this, I'm going to apply one of the most advanced techniques that I know. I'm going to duplicate and drag the luminance layer to the top and duplicate it twice to make three luminance layers. Then I'm going to layer one of those layers, luminance or L fine, one luminance or L medium, and one luminance or L coarse. Then I'm going to run the frequency separation filter on each one of those luminance layers. On the L fine layer, I'm just going to run a little bit of frequency separation. So I'll drag the viewer slider all the way across so I can see what I'm doing. And then the radius slider just a little across until a sharp and delicate outline of the Eagle Nebula appears. When I reach that point, I'll apply the tool and that layer will be torn in half into its high frequency and low frequency components. The low frequency is where brightness is and I don't need that, so I'll delete that. And later, we'll apply the fine high frequency information to the image, but for the moment, I'm going to make it invisible, and I'm going to make the L medium layer visible and then run the frequency separation tool on it. Just as before, I'll pull the viewer slider all the way to the right of the image so that I can see the effects of the radius slider on the image, and then pull the radius slider to the right until I have a medium fine outline of the high frequency information in the Eagle Nebula appear. At which point I'll apply the separation, the L medium layer will be torn in half, I will again discard the low frequency component, make the high frequency components invisible, and then do the same operation on the L coarse layer. Except this time, I'll extract all the high frequency information by running the radius slider all the way to the right, all the way to 100 pixels, and then separating the image. I've also labeled the fine, medium, and coarse high frequency layers to avoid confusion as I work with them. Now I'll make the coarse and medium layers invisible and make the fine high frequency layer visible. Then I'm going to pull the opacity slider all the way back to zero and then slowly add opacity back until the fine and delicate definition within this image is resolved. Then I'll select the next layer, the medium high frequency layer, and do the same thing on that layer. The goal is to push up the opacity of each layer until just enough definition is showing that the details within the image are finally resolved. The moment the image starts to look coarse, I pull back the slider a little bit, and that's where I stop. And once the fine and medium high frequency layers are properly adjusted, it's time to move on to the coarse high frequency layer. And using the exact same process, I'll move the opacity all the way to zero, and then slowly add it back until the definition within the image begins to show a bit of coarseness, and then I'll pull the slider a little bit back, and they're undone. And note that sometimes while working on this, I'll turn the other high frequency layers on and off. This is because the high frequency information from one layer is going to build on or add to the next. So sometimes it helps to see the effect of a particular layer all by itself on the image. And sometimes it helps to remove the other layers in order to see the effect of an individual layer on the image. Overall, I like the outcome that I'm getting here. However, in the darkest regions of the image, the high frequency information makes the image too black. That's easy to fix though. I'll just select the uppermost layer and go over to the eraser and click on it, and then partially erase out the effect of the fine high frequency layer on the darkest regions of the image. And if, when that's done, the image still looks too dark in the darker areas, then I'll go to the medium high frequency information and do the same operation. And, if need be, to the coarse high frequency information and do the same operation again. Now there is good definition within this image and dramatic interplay between the lights and shadow of the Star Queen at the center and the darker stardust around the outside of the image. But I still want to enrich the color, pushing the global saturation to enrich the reds and try to enhance whatever trace of blue might be in the image at this time. To do this, I'll add a vibrance tool and push the vibrance all the way up and add a bit to the saturation. Vibrance is a delicate slider. It mostly emphasizes weaker colors, so you can push vibrance pretty hard without running much risk of saturation clipping. You do have to be careful with the saturation slider. You can easily saturation clip with it. So as you work with it, watch very closely for the development of color artifacts or color noise within the image. Then I'll open up the curves tool, select the green channel and pull a little green out of the image, which is going to enrich the reds, but impoverish the blues. So I'll just focus at the moment on really enriching the red area of this image. When I've gotten the reds where I want them with the curves tool, I'll then open up a hue saturation luminance tool or HSL tool and make a very slight but global shift to the hue to slightly enrich the reds a bit more. Now, while there isn't much blue information in this image, there is some, and now might be a good time to try again to draw out what information is there. 
I'll introduce a new channel mixer tool into the image, placing it above the pixel layer and all the other color adjustment layers, and make some global changes but focus on the green channel. As the green is an in-between color and not a primary color, making changes to it can sometimes both enrich reds and blues. If there is a way to develop out that blue information hidden in the white region of the nebula, it's by modifying the effect of the green channel on the image. I think that's as far as I can push the color without more advanced editing. So it's time to bring in the star plate. And then I'm going to duplicate the star plate and apply a technique I call two plate color dodge screening. So I'll temporarily make the upper star plates invisible and set the lower star plate to a color dodge screen composite mode. Now there are an awful lot of stars in the Eagle Nebula and they can easily drown out the delicate light and shadow and color within the nebula. So they need to be toned down to do that, I'll put a Curves tool into the Color Dodge Star Plate, and in the bottom eighth of the Curves tool, I'll left-click on the curve line, thereby grabbing it, and drag very slowly to the right, which will partially mute the impact of the stars in a very controlled and natural-looking way. Then I'll go to the Star Plate above, make it visible, and change its composite mode to screen, so it'll add all of its light and color to the Star Plates and the rest of the image below. Then I'll open up a Curves tool in the screened star plate and use the same procedure as I did with the Color Dodge star plate to reduce the impact of the stars on this image. Frequently, I would accomplish this by reducing the star plate's opacity, but all images share the common characteristic that no single workflow is going to work for every image, and reducing opacity on the Eagle Nebula causes the star plates to introduce artifacts into the image. So the Curves tool in this case reduces the impact of the stars more effectively than changing the opacity slider, while at the same time leaving the stars with a glowing luster. Now the image is coming along nicely, but the blue is still nowhere where I want it, and I know why this is. While imaging the Star Queen, during two nights some clouds rolled over and they interfered with the blue parts of the filming sequence. And on the other couple nights, there were moments of poor seeing which also mostly interfered with the blue sequence. So there just is not enough blue information in this image. I can deal with this in two ways. I can take another clear night and task the observatory with once again imaging the Star Queen Nebula, this time gathering only information on the blue filter. That would definitely get the blue channel back in balance with the other channels. But it would cost me a clear night that I could spend imaging another interesting target. So there is another way to accomplish this task, because the information that I'm looking for is already there in the image. I just need to bring it out very specifically. And an expert level of the application of frequency separation theory can accomplish just that. We'll look at that, along with even more advanced techniques to push the sharpening we have accomplished even further in the next and final episode on advanced LRGB processing. So, see you next time. I hope you've enjoyed this episode and learned something, and if you have any thoughts, observations, questions, or suggestions, please leave them in the comments section below. And if you enjoy what you find on this channel, please take a moment to like and subscribe. Now, have a blast doing astrophotography, and get out there and shoot that beautiful sky.